Good morning, and welcome to the last Sunday of 2020. Woohoo! <laughs> oh, I don't know about you, but uh, there's just something about this year that was absolutely crazy. So, um, who knows what 2021 is going to be like, but we're just good to be closing the door. Excited to be closing the door on 2020. <clears throat> well, I, um, I found that it's really easy to be preoccupied and um, hard to keep thinking about what's right in front of me when there's lots of crud happening behind me or there's lots of difficulty ahead of me. My mind isn't in it uh, where I'm at right now and that's what I want to talk about today. But before I get started, I want to just point out that um, starting tomorrow morning, we're starting a new online Bible study. Earlier this year, we did daily study sheets in the book of Acts. And it's not just about gaining Bible knowledge. It's about helping you interact with God. Helping to develop your relationship with God. We did a study on Acts for several weeks. We did a study on 2, Chronicle, or 2 Corinthians 5 for a few weeks, and starting tomorrow, we are doing another study on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there were lots of discussions of, is Jesus coming back soon? Are we living in the end times? And since people are asking me that all the time, I thought it might be a good time to see what Paul wrote and how he told us to approach that kind of concern. So, if you get our weekly emails, then you'll get the daily study sheets. You can print them and write on them, or you can read them and write in a notebook. Either way is fine, but they will be coming by email Monday through Saturday, starting tomorrow. So, I encourage you to participate in this because, again, it's not so you earn bonus points with God, and it's not so that you gain lots of Bible knowledge. It's develop, you developing a relationship with God and interacting with Him on a daily basis. And when you start doing that, everything changes. So, if um, <clears throat> you don't get our weekly emails and you want to participate in this, then uh, you can text your email address to the church number, or to the church email and we will add you on the list so that you get those. Some people um, also would like to have physical paper in their hands, not a printer. So if you'd like us to make up a binder with um, all 20, 19 or 20 study sheets in it, we'll do that. But it'll cost uh, $10 to put it together. Uh, if you want to pay online for that, pay 11 to cover the fees and uh, let us know and um, we will get that to you probably not for a couple of weeks so i encourage you to start with the online study tomorrow and you will be blessed so all right that was our commercial <laughs> now to today's message which i'm calling where is your mind you ever have uh your mom ask you that you do some goofy mistake and your mom, where is your head? Or um, you're at work and you're very distracted and people are asking, what, what's on your mind? Or It's a question they ask, where is your mind? Well, obviously your mind is in your head. But what you are dwelling on, what you are thinking about, is somewhere else. And that's what they're asking. Matter of fact, in the Gospel of John chapter 15, in the first 12 verses, well, all throughout the Gospel of John, there's a word that um, he uses over and over. And um, the NIV uses the word remain. Other translations use the word abide or, abide or dwell. In other words, it's like where do you live? People asked in chapter 1, Jesus, yeah, Lord, where do you where do you abide? In other words, where do you live? Where's your headquarters? Where, where does everything you do flow out from? And Jesus said, follow me and check it out. So, um, that word is all throughout the Gospel of John. It's an important theme 
about where you dwell, where you live, where you abide. So, in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, it says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You, all, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love, or dwell in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. So, I don't know if some of these concern you where Jesus says, you know, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. Um, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Does that sound like conditional love to you? No, it's how you stay close to Jesus. You walk with him. Some people, if they're tired of you and don't want to be your friend anymore, then they're just saying, you know what? I'm not hanging out with you anymore. I'm not walking with you. Well, Jesus says, if you walk with me, doing what I commanded you to do, then you'll be remaining in my love. It's not a reward punishment thing. It's just the natural outcome of your actions. So um, I find people invest too much emotional energy in trying to read their life as a series of rewards and punishment. You know what? That comes after death. What comes before death is the natural or spiritual consequences of your actions. You don't drop a foot, a, a brick, and watch it hit your foot and say, Oh God, why are you letting this pain come on me? No, it's because you dropped a brick on your foot. It has nothing to do with reward or punishment. Has to do with gravity. So, a lot of what Jesus tells us is, hey, if you mix this and this, here is what the results are going to be. It's not about reward or punishment. So, try to keep that in mind because people are, some people are constantly analyzing themselves. Am I a good person? Do I deserve rewards? One, you're not a good person or a bad person. You're a person who does good things or a person who does bad things. The only good is Jesus, and hopefully he lives in you. All right, back to our message. So we want to kind of focus on verse 11, where he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Some people think the Christian life means you have to suffer and be miserable, and somehow this earns bonus points with God, and then you die. No, God has called us to a life of joy and peace. That's his intentions for you. And if you're trying really hard to be super religious and you're miserable, then you need to drop the religious act and just start hanging out with Jesus, abiding with him. Let me ask you this. Where is your mind? What do you think about all the time? What place do you fill your mind with? When you want to remember something pleasant... What do you fill your mind with? Is it a place where you can't go anymore? 
Maybe it's a place of your childhood and it's changed now, but when you sit down and think about it, it brings a smile to your face because of what you experienced there. You may be sitting in your living room a thousand miles away from that place, but you can close your eyes, think about it, and re-experience those emotions with it. You can do that in a good way, you can do that in a bad way. Those of you who spent some time in jail or in prison, have you been set free or is your mind still in prison? If it is, that's a tragedy because you were released from prison but you choose to keep your mind there. You might think, oh, but you don't understand how terrible it was. I do, that's why I want you to leave. I want you to get your head out of there and get your head in the here and now because while you're reliving the misery back there, you're missing the blessings of God that are all around you right now. There was a uh, experience we had where in 2019, 30 of us from Crosstown went up to Sugar Pine for family camp. And for many people, it was the first time going to Sugar Pine. And for some people, it was the first time having that kind of an experience in the mountains. And it was just wonderful sights, wonderful smells, a place of peace. Um, it was just wonderful. So we had a cabin with a whole bunch of our single ladies who stayed together in that cabin. And a lot of our single ladies, they have a good testimony. They have kind of a rough background. And so they were in their cabin and they were talking and most of them were laying on their bunks. And Paula and I walked into their cabin to just kind of explain how the things at camp work, how they can find the things that they need and how they can know where they need to be at certain times. And so I'm explaining to them, they're all laying on their bunks looking at me, and then one of them says, wow, this brings back memories of roll call, <laughs> bunk roll call, when I was incarcerated. And then they all laughed, yeah, it does. <laughs> well, they were able to laugh and joke about it because their mind isn't still back there. And so it's not a daily trauma for them. They have found Jesus, they have moved on, and so... Um, they can joke about that past now because they've chosen not to dwell there. <clears throat> Those of you who are always harboring resentment, although your body is in another place, you are choosing to keep your mind in the place of injustice. Again, let me repeat that. Those of you who cling to your resentment and offense are choosing to dwell, choosing to live in the place of injustice. Your life got better and you are rejecting that and choosing to live in the midst of injustice. You are choosing to keep your life in the hands of the abuser rather than looking at who is in your life now. If you spend all day now thinking about life before last March, before everything got shut down, then you're not living here and now, your mind is still back there. Some of you, it's like, and I, I did an example a couple of weeks ago, it's like you're stretching a rubber band and you're waiting to be able to relax it again. You're assuming once the ball drops, New Year's Eve, then suddenly it's gonna be like January 2019 again with no shutdown. That's not the case. Your mind needs to be here, not trapped back in last year. Alexander Graham Bell said something that some people think is in the Bible. <clears throat> he, it's actually him who said, uh, when God closes a door, another door opens. He opens another door. That's not in the Bible. That was Alexander Graham Bell. The actual quote he said was this, when one door closes, another opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one that is opened for us. Very profound. So when something closes and God opens a door, some people never find that open door because they're standing there grieving. Lord, why? What did I do wrong? Why is this door closed now? Meanwhile, God wants to bless you. He wants to walk you through something new but you're refusing to take your mind somewhere new because 
you liked it where something old was. You need to live in the here and now. So where do you like to dwell? Where is your where is your peaceful place? For some people, it's Camp Sugar Pine. They, if you ask them, what was it like when you went to family camp last year? Then kind of they gaze off to the side somewhere like they're thinking about their first <laughs> crush. And then they start talking about Sugar Pine. And as they tell you about it, they actually start to experience the feelings of peace and joy that they have when they are there. Just thinking about it brings you joy. Why? Because your favorite place, whether it's the old fishing hole that you liked, or grandma's house, or sugar pine, or wherever it is, you can mentally go there and experience that same kind of joy. Why did you like it? Maybe you, to you it was a safe place. Maybe to you it was a place where you were felt loved and cared for. So let me ask you this, what about it brings you peace? What about that place brings you joy? Think about that for a minute. What about your favorite place brings you peace and joy? It's worth thinking about because then you might be able to replicate that in the here and now in some way. <clears throat> let me ask you this, do you feel guilty for not being there right now? No, that would be kind of silly. Um, and you don't go to those places because it's your duty as a good person. No, you go there because you're drawn to it. You're drawn to the peace. You're drawn to the joy. You're drawn to the beauty of your favorite spot. It, it draws you to it. And again, just telling us about it starts bringing that peace and that joy back again. Well, Jesus intends for you to live in his peace and joy, as we read in John 15. It's not something that you try to achieve and then you feel guilty for falling short. I used to do that a lot growing up. I thought, I'm supposed to have peace and joy in the Lord, but I'm nervous, I'm afraid, I must be a bad person, and then that would just throw gasoline on the fire. And um, yeah, it's not a goal that you achieve, it's a place where you arrive. And if you're not there, then you change things and you take some actions, which we'll talk about, that will help you get into that place. It's not your joy to conjure up, but Jesus said that you would have his joy. Jesus wants to draw you there to be with Him, to be in His presence, to live with Him. And I'm not just talking about dying and going to heaven, I'm talking about here on earth, here and now. Your mind needs to be with Him now. Let me ask you this, have you ever gone to your peaceful place, to a, a place of beauty and tranquility, and all you did while you were there was worry about things at home? What an amazing waste of time and energy. Here you're not allowing the beauty and the place and the wonder of God to fill your mind and heart, but instead you're just worrying about what could go wrong somewhere else. Let me ask you this, where can you go where you won't fear for your children's safety? I found some people, they could not be away from their kids without fear until they out loud prayed to God, Lord, I know you love my children more than I do, as hard as that is to imagine. And so, Lord, I trust the lives of my children in your hands. And when they prayed that out loud, it broke something in the spirit realm. And then these couples were able to start enjoying a weekend away and uh, enjoying vacations away without constantly worrying about their kids. But Jesus calls us to abide with him right here and right now. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He's not talking about someday when you go to heaven. He's talking about right here, right now on earth. 
you choosing in your mind to dwell in God's presence. It will bring you peace and rest and protection. It's where you choose to be. So how do we go our, to our place of joy? I'm going to give you three things. First of all, and you might say, you talk about this almost every week. Well, maybe it's important, and you will be blessed if you do it. One, fill yourself with God's Word. You can't lean on the promises of God if you know, have no idea what they are. Verse 7 says, remain in me, and my words remain in you. you the Word of God can't dwell, can't thrive in you, if you never take them in, if you never read it. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus compared it to eating every day. You eat for fuel so that you can live. You take in the word of God to fuel your spirit so you can live. You meditate on scriptures. Meditate means just thinking about them. So when you take in the scriptures, think about them. Put yourself in them. If something sounds pleasant or helpful or good, sit there and just try to picture it in your mind. Spend some time meditating on the Word of God. Another way you can do this, start doing those daily Bible sheets tomorrow. When they start coming, read everything in it. Get a pen or pencil. Answer all the questions in it. Answer them honestly and truthfully. Don't just hope to try to get the right answer. That's not what this is about. It's about you interacting with God. Second thing we want you to do is this. Choose to believe that Jesus loves you no matter what. That he paid the price for your sin because he values you. Verse 9 says, remain in my love. That doesn't mean don't screw up so he rejects you. He's saying, don't run away. Stay in his love. Stay with him. You ever thought, Jesus knows the future so he was never disappointed in you? You never let him down? Kind of interesting to think about. I had a friend, I knew he was going to screw up in various circumstances. So I just planned accordingly. I didn't resent him or hate him for it because it's just kind of the way he was wired. God's the one who actually wired you. He knows what you are like. He knows your weaknesses and your strengths. He's not shocked by anything. He's not disappointed. He loves you, and he wants you to stay and remain in that love. But if you don't believe Jesus loves you, then you're going to go off elsewhere and try to find that deep love somewhere else, and you're going to damage yourself. So, don't talk yourself out of it. Don't think there's some cosmic loophole that lets God off the hook so he doesn't have to love you anymore. He is love itself. When God is just being himself, he loves you. So you got to just wrap your head around that and uh, understand that. Let Jesus love you. Stop making it conditional. Like, if I can go all day without sinning, then Jesus will be really pleased with you. Jesus isn't impressed with you. He loves you. He likes to have you close to him. So, Drop all the conditional stuff. If, if I'm only good enough or if I weren't so bad, get rid of those things and just know it's the nature of the relationship. Martin Luther said, anyone trusting in their own good works is breaking the first commandment. In other words, if I just read and pray enough, then God will love me. Well, then your hope is in you and your abilities, not in the love and mercy of God. So that's what Martin Luther is talking about. If you're trusting in your own goodness, your own good works, then you've broken the first commandment. In other words, you are the God before God Almighty. And then he says, breaking commandments 2 through 10 is based on the belief that something other than God is the source of what you need, which again breaks the first commandment. So what you need is found in Christ. And if you're saying, well, I tried that, it didn't work. Well, you must have been following a different Jesus rather than the Jesus of the Bible. Okay, third, let God fill you with love for others. 
This has been very helpful and refreshing for me myself because some people are just a mess or they're a, annoying or whatever and I've asked God to pour his love for that person into me and he does. He doesn't slap you around and say, come on, you know, do a better job. No, he's waiting to be invited into your life to fill you in these various ways because You'll know if you love others if you serve them because you always serve the people you love. So there may be some people, it's like, well, yeah, I love them. It's like, well, let's go do something for them. And you're like, why? Yeah, you don't really love them. You just don't hate them that much. Verses John 5, 10, or 15, verses 10 and 12, Jesus said this, If you obey my commands... You will remain in my love. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. That's pretty straightforward. That's his command. That you would love people. You can't really do this in isolation. I say this while we're all in isolation. But you can't do this without any contact with anybody else. You can get on the phone, you can get on Zoom, you can get on FaceTime, you can put on a mask, you can do something. But uh, you need to be involved with other people in your life. You, it's not good for you to sit at home and, and to just mind your own business and claim you love others. There's other people who are wondering if God even is real and even cares about them. And when you call to talk to them, part of that message is, I cared enough about you to give you a call. So, you can do this even in isolation. Sometimes you, you see disasters. I see this all the time. I go to crime scenes or, or people's lives that have been shattered. And you know what we do? Through the grace of God, we find what is good in the middle of the mess. We find what is good in the middle of the mess, and we highlight it. We shine a light on it. And you know what I found? In those darkest times, when you reflect the light of Christ in that, it spreads. It dispels the shadows, and the darkness starts to fade. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then John 5, 15, 11 says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So again, God's intention for you is for your life to be filled with peace and joy. And if it's not, it's not because you're not trying hard enough. It's because you're thinking wrongly about who Jesus is and how he feels towards you. Because when you know you are loved by somebody of the utmost importance, a lot of other nonsense doesn't bother you. So, where is your place of peace and joy? Where is it you like to go for tranquility and to get away? Why do you feel peace and joy there? Is it because nobody can get a hold of you? And yet when you come home, you think you got to leave your phone on 24-7? Why don't you shut it off? Well, some people are like, somebody might need me. Are you afraid they'll think you're a bad person? Why are you looking and trying to gain the praise of men? Shut your phone off and enjoy the peace and tranquility. Don't sit there fussing about it. Think through. Why do you feel peace and joy in the place that you like to go? And what is keeping you from having that peace and joy right here, right now, right where you are at? Because you know what? Jesus is inviting you to dwell with Him. That's what this whole passage is about, abiding with Him, living with Him, remaining in Him. So you might need to ask yourself this, what part of your life 
don't you trust Jesus with? Do you not trust him with your money? Are you afraid Jesus favors the poor so he wants to take away all your money? Are you afraid he's going to kill your kids to teach you some sort of great strength? That's a pretty twisted view. What is it, what part, area of your life don't you trust Jesus with? And then think through, start looking through the Bible. What does the Bible actually say about that? Because his intentions for you is for you to live a life of peace and joy. So take some time to plan how to get from here to there. And we're not talking about going to a physical place. It's about moving your mind to another place. Do you want to dwell in God's presence? In his presence of peace and joy? You may be thinking, well, yeah, but i got to function in the real world. That's exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about you walking through the chaos with peace and joy in your heart. What keeps you from having peace and joy daily? Let me give you three examples. One, just being busy. And um, I used to feel victimized by the clock and the calendar because I had so much to do until I realized I was the one setting all the appointments. I was the one to blame. I need to cut out about half of them. And I found out when people said, hey, can I talk to you this week? In my head, I, I got this false sense of urgency as soon as physically possible. How about 8 a.m. Monday, which would just kill me to get up 8 a.m. Monday and meet with somebody. I re had to realize they don't care when this week. It could be Friday afternoon. So I shouldn't put a sense of urgency on it that isn't even there. When I'm busy... A big part of my problem is that my mind is three, at least three steps ahead of where I am currently. And so when I'm talking, I lose where I'm going talking. I sound like an idiot because my mind is already on the next appointment or the next thing. I even found, looking back at my college notes, that I would write words and I often left the last letter off of the word I was writing because my brain was already four or five words down the sentence. So, I've had to really work hard to live in the present and to let go of whatever else is ahead. If you have dinner with your family and you get up and answer the phone when it rings, then your head is not at the dinner table with your family and they are not your highest priority. You need to shut the phone off and look your family in the eye and listen to them like you love them and care about them. So... Don't let busyness rob you of your peace and joy. Second is worry. When you're worrying about what if this happens, what if that happens, God just revealed something terrible to me about this. I was, I was saying when you're worried about something, your mind is in that place. When you have unforgiveness to your abuser from 20 years ago, you are choosing to live with that abuser. To, to have your mind with that abuser instead of leaving them and living in the here and now. And when you are constantly worried, you are choosing to live in a place of abuse that you've created in your own head. If you're constantly worried about your kids, then you are choosing to live in a place where your children are abused. You need to let that go. You need to risk success and peace and joy because worry gives the illusion of caring but the reality is it robs you of joy today nobody will call you a fool for enjoying today even if hardship strikes tomorrow at least you enjoyed today but there are some people they cannot enjoy a day at all well, I worry about this and I worry about... All that worry does nothing except rob you of what God... It's almost an accusation. God, you're going to let me down. Then what am I going to do? Don't live in the place where your loved ones are being abused or killed. Live in the here and now and thank God that they're alive and with you today. I'm trying to learn Spanish and it's kind of interesting. The uh, Spanish word for busy is ocupado, like you are occupied. And their word for worried 
is preoccupado or preoccupied. And when we say somebody is preoccupied, it means they're standing there in front of you, but their mind is on a different situation. Their mind is somewhere else. In the Spanish, that's exactly the definition of worry to them, being preoccupied. Your body is here, but your mind is somewhere else. And the thing is that somewhere else, you can't do anything about that. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. You can deal with tomorrow's problems tomorrow. But he, his intention for you is peace and joy. Because what a phenomenal waste of time if you worry about what's going to happen tomorrow and you toss and turn and you're restless and then tomorrow goes perfectly smooth. Then you've totally wasted today. You wasted and squandered the joys that God had for you today assuming God was going to let you down tomorrow. Let that stuff go. In faith, risk enjoying the here and now and living in the peace and joy. The third thing that we need to get rid of is fear. The Bible calls God the Lord of hosts. You read that in, in some translations. Some say God Almighty. But a lot of them say that when it says the Lord of hosts will be with you. Well, when it uses that word hosts, what it means in the Hebrew is the his angel armies. So it's like he's the commander of the angel armies, the Lord of hosts. So if the Lord of hosts is watching over you, you got a whole army watching over you. So you need to let go of the fear. And again, the fear is something terrible is going to happen to me. And uh, if it doesn't happen, then you're like, Ooh, okay, good. But you just squandered all that time fussing, making yourself sick, and uh, saying, God, I'm just sure you are not going to come through for me. In faith, trust in God. Because you know what? Jesus is inviting you to dwell with him. And when you dwell with Jesus, there is nothing to fear. And you follow his lead so you don't have to get real busy. And if your goal is to walk with him, then he will supply all your needs so you don't need to be preoccupied about how things are going to work. It's interesting. Rather than dreaming of living in God's presence someday when you die or thinking about what it was like when the temple was built and to enter into God's presence in the Holy of Holies, you need to understand this. Instead, God has chosen to dwell in you. If you've said yes to the Lord Jesus, then His Holy Spirit dwells in you. So, that's where He lives. That's where He remains. That's where He abides. He abides in you. So, that's where you live now. So, let your mind be here and now. On Friday, 2020 is over. Don't dwell there. Matter of fact, don't dwell in 2019. Step into 2021. See it as new, uncharted territory and see what God wants to do with you there. Be here now. Let 2021 define itself because you know what? Even though you might walk through the very valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil because he is with you, living in you. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for each and every person watching this. Lord, I ask that you would cut through the noise and the concern and the darkness and fill them with your joy and peace, even to the point where it doesn't make sense for them. But Lord, let them experience your peace, your joy, your holy presence, as you dwell in their hearts. And Lord, I ask that you would demonstrate to them how you are more than capable of taking care of tomorrow. You've got it. So they don't need to worry about it. They just need to do whatever it is you tell them to do for it. Lord, thank you. Thank you that it is not your intention that we suffer. Suffering comes from the devil and your word says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So, Lord, thank you that your intention is for us to have 
peace, and joy. Lord, you are the lover of our soul, and we thank you for that. We want to walk with you each and every day, dwelling in your holy presence. Lord, you've been really good to us, and we thank you for that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, and God bless you.